She made it seem smaller by wearing her hair parted in the middle and drawn tightly over her ears. She had many variations of this hairdo. The one I liked best was when she tucked a frangipani behind her left ear. You know the frangipani? A white, waxy flower. Very sweet, but darker. The same way she looked like all the beautiful girls you have ever known, but darker. Her old man was the planter I told you about. Quite a character. Lived up north. Her mother was a Javanese servant girl. It was hard to tell which of her parents she was like. She was an Oriental, that is true. She had the slant eyes. But she had French traits too. Like her old man, she was clever, witty, pensive, industrious, hot-tempered and, well, pretty damned sexy. In a nice way, you understand. Nothing rough. At other times, she was mystical and brooding, silent as a cat. She got these things from her Buddhist mother. I met her, said Bus, in the damnedest way. Put into the airstrip at Luanapuri and borrowed a jeep. I drove up past the two houses to her plantation. You know, white picket fence and big flower garden. Madame Barzan, I said. Up north. A pilot was shot down. He died. Not in my arms, exactly. But he told me. She smiled at me with her little head on one side. I hear all about you, Mr. Bus Adams. At the airport, they say, he won good guy. Knock off that stuff, Bus. You like to have dinner here tonight? I think, said Bus. Everyone who dined with Latouche Barzan will agree that dinner with her was a memorable affair. On her plantation were many small houses. What they were all for, I never knew. One was a marvellous salon. It was made of woven bamboo, floor, roofing and side panels. In it were twelve or fifteen chairs, four small tables, three long benches and a bar. Before dinner, we gathered there for drinks. You could find most of the officers on Luana Pori at Latouche's. Everyone was welcome. We all loved to watch her placid oriental mask break into naughty French lights and shadows when she was teasing some elderly colonel for some tyres for her Australian car or a truckload of oil for her generator. She would pout and suck in her high cheeks. And then, if you were a man standing near her, you had to fight hard to keep from kissing her. She knew this for I have often seen her rub very close to some older officer and laugh at his dumb jokes until I am sure the old fool's head was in a whirl. That was how she got so much of the equipment she needed. Ah, oh, Major, she would pout. I like to build one small house for butcher. How are I going to get some cement? You got some Portland cement? Not that she was stingy with her money. As you will see, she fed half the American army on Luana Pori, but there was not anything to spend money on if the army had cement. Well, it was only sensible to invite the army to dinner. Bus, she asked me one night, where I get some Remington Point 22 shells. What in the world do you want with Point 22 shells? I asked. For shoot wild chickens. How you think we catch wild chicken we serve here all time? Salt on his tail? She laughed softly at her joke. No matter what you paid for her dinners, they were worth it. A door lock, an ice machine, new copper wiring, an aviation clock set in mahogany from a propeller. They were well spent. About seven in the evening, Noe, the Javanese servant, would announce dinner in a high voice. We would then pass from the salon to the dining house. This was severely plain, with one very long table made of jungle planks rubbed brown. Latouche sat the head of table. I sat beside her at first. While we waited for the soup to be served, there was a moment of great anticipation. Then Latouche's three sisters entered. First was Josephine. She was nineteen. More Javanese than Latouche. Slim and with breasts you could sleep on forever. She was engaged to a marine sergeant. He pulled the engagement gag so he could live with her while he was on Luana Pori. But when he almost got dead on Kenora, he became like a wild man. His commanding officer let him hitchhike back more than two thousand miles to marry her. She was like that. Laurent Saint was seventeen, beautiful like Latouche. Marthe was only fifteen when I first saw her. She was the queen of the group. Having lived among older men from the beginning of the war, she had acquired some damned cute little ways. She knew this and kept her soft almond eye directed down toward her plate. Then, once or twice each meal, she would raise them at some young officer and knock him silly with her charm. There was a good deal of food spilt at Luana Pori, mostly by young men looking at Mart. Latouche served excellent meals. She butchered a beef at least twice a week, had her natives scour the woods for wild chicken and the shore for seafood, 
Occasionally, when American hunters bagged a deer up in the hills, she would cook it for them. And whenever a food ship arrived from the States, someone would always manage to steal a truckload of steaks and turkeys and corned beef and succotash and sneak it into Latouche's shed at night and whisper, Our steward is a louse. He cannot cook water. Uses no spices at all. Ah, well, Latouche would sympathise. In the jungle, what you expect? I give this to Noé. We see what he can do with it. When dinner was over, Latouche led her guests back to the salon, where six or seven attractive French women of the islands were waiting. I never clearly understood who these girls were, where they ate their meals, or how they got to the plantation. They always went home in jeeps. The introductions over, Latouche would slip back to the dining house where I waited for her. Who are those girls? I asked one night as she curled up in a chair with me. She smiled, a Javanese sort of smile. I like men, she said. American men I like very much, is no good men by themselves all the time. I understand not less than six marriages resulted from Latouche's dinners. But for me, the best part came when Noé finished removing the dishes and took the pressure lamp back to the kitchen. Then Latouche and I sat in the shadowy darkness of the dining house and played records on the old Victrola her father had brought her from Australia. She loved American music. I had to laugh. I used to sit there in the dark and think of wives of colonels and majors back home telling their bridge clubs, John gets so lonesome on the islands. The children and I sent him some records last week. And there they were, in Latouche's white dining house. There were also some Javanese records. I loved those crazy melodies, especially when Latouche accompanied the wailing music in a sing-song voice. When she grew tired, she would kiss me softly in the ear and whisper, this next one for Mr. Bus Adams, special. Then she would play Yvonne Printemps's French recording of Au Claire de la Lune. She said it was an old record. The machine was not good and the needle scratched, but the music sounded fine there at the edge of the jungle. You know how it goes. Dum, 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 dum. The girl's name is spelled Printemps, but you say it Printemps. You do not sound the final pièce, and she can really sing. The last record was for Latouche. Then I kissed her and she closed her eyes, and I could feel her shivering, but not from love. By the way, have you ever heard Hildegard sing The Last Time I Saw Paris? Not much of a song, but brother, when you hear it in a bamboo room with Latouche Barzan twisting nervously in your arms. Bus, she whispered. Paris? What it like? I would try to tell her. I made up a lot, for she was mad to know about Paris. All I remembered was wide, beautiful streets and narrow, crooked ones. I recalled something about the opera there, the Louvre and Notre Dame. Mostly I had to think of movies I had seen. Once I got started on the Rue Claude Bernard, where I used to live near a cheese market. I embroidered that street until even the cheese merchant wouldn't have known it. But it was worth it, for when the music stopped and my voice with it, Latouche would kiss me wildly and cry, Oh, bus, I wish you not married. I wish my husband he dead. You and I, we get married. Latouche! I whispered. For God's sake, do not talk like that. Why not? I wish my husband he dead up there in the hills. Then everything all right. I marry some nice American. Stop it. What's the matter, bus? You no wish your wife she dead sometime? It is not funny, Latouche, I protested. My forehead was wet. I not say it funny, she mused, quietly buttoning her dress. I talk very serious. When you kissing me, I suppose you never wish your wife dead? I felt funny inside. You know how it is. You are out in the islands. You have a wife, but you do not have a wife. Sometimes the idea flashes through your head. Without your thinking it, understand, and you draw back in horror. What in hell am I saying? What kind of a man am I, anyway? And all the time a girl like Latouche is in your arms, her black hair about your face, the smell of frangipani everywhere, and when she hammers that question at you, as if she were the horrible little voice. Man, you take a deep breath and you do not answer. I did not blame Latouche for wanting her husband dead. Achille Barzan was a pretty poor sort, the son of French peasants who had been deported to Noumea years before for some crime. No one remembered what. They had chopped their plantation from the jungle. Alone, they planted coconut trees and nursed cacao bushes into trees. They lived like less than pigs for eight years, getting no returns, going deeper into debt. Then, just as the plantation started to make money, 
Their son married Latouche de Beck, illegitimate daughter of a renegade Frenchman who lived with one coloured girl after another. Their only comfort was that Latouche had brought dowry. Her father stole it from some planter up north, and the girl was good-looking. Too good-looking, old Madame Barzan observed. She will bring sorrow to our son. Mark my words. The old woman had early detected Latouche's willfulness. It was no surprise to her, therefore, when Achille had to knock her down and forbid her to visit Noumea, nor could the family do anything to make her stop ridiculing old Pétain. The Barzans, mother, father, son, saw clearly that only the grim marshal's plan of work and discipline could save France. Why, look, Achille said, every de Gaullist in the islands is what Pétain said in his speech, undisciplined. In Noumea, where people understood such things, most substantial men were Pétainists. Only the rabble were de Gaullists. Latouche herself was proof of that. A half-caste, an illegitimate half-caste, too. You might as well call her a de Gaulliste. The words meant about the same. The Barzans were pleasantly surprised, therefore, when Latouche suddenly became disciplined, accepted her husband's judgment, and became a respectable Pétainiste. They were even more surprised when two boats put into the bay and a group of fiery men, led by Latouche's own father, stormed ashore and placed everyone under arrest. Everyone, that is, except Achille, who fled to the jungle. There they are, Latouche reported icily. Standing before the two miserable Barzans, she denounced them. They want to give up, she said with disdain. Take them away, Latouche's father ordered. At this old Madame Barzan's peasant mind snapped. Thief! she screamed, beating at Latouche with her bare hands. An undersized de Gaullist from Effate tried to stop her outcries, but old man Barzan thought his wife was being attacked. Grabbing a stick of wood, he lunged at the little man and beat him over the head. Throw them in jail! Latouche's father commanded. Madame Barzan, gabbling of thieves and murderers and whores, died in the boat. The old man remained in jail. The little fellow he had beaten was still affected after two years. His head jerked, and he could not pronounce the letter S. Latouche rarely spoke of the wretched family. She brought her three sisters to the plantation before the Americans came. She reasoned that the Yanks would occupy Luana Pori. She wanted her sisters ready. Even during the agonizing days of the Coral Sea battles, she refused to move inland. I think Americans they win. If they lose, I finished anyway. Japanese probably make that dirty Achille Barzan commissioner of Luana Pori, I suppose. Shortly after she told me about her husband, I left the Navy camp and moved up to the plantation. Latouche and I had one of the little white houses among the flower gardens. It was made of bamboo, immaculately clean. Six or eight of Latouche's dresses hung along one wall. On the other was a coloured print showing a street in Paris. Six books were on the wicker table, Gone with the Wind and five Tauchnitz editions of German novels. There were two chairs, one covered with flowered chintz. Latouche and I were very happy in that little house. Mostly she wore a halter made of some cheap print from Australia and a pair of expensive twill shorts a colonel had got her from Lord and Taylor's in New York. She went barefooted. We slept through the hot afternoons, waiting for the crowd to come out for dinner. Noé would bring us cold limeades, slipping into the little house, whether we were dressed or not. I often try to recall what I wrote my wife during those days. Darling, the deep sores on my wrists are better now. It is cooler on this island. But the sores that ate at my heart, I did not tell her about them. It was about this time that Lieutenant Colonel Haricot led his raid on the plantation. He stormed into the salon one night about seven and stood at attention like a gorlighter. Everything on this plantation stolen from the United States government will be hauled away tomorrow morning, he announced. He even clapped his hands, and a very young lieutenant made a note of the order. Then he nodded to a French woman much older than Latouche and started to go. But I own everything, Latouche said, interrupting his passage. Are you the madame's daughter? he asked pompously. I am the madame, Latouche replied, nodding. Madame Barzan. Haricot, who had been given his job of civil affairs officer because of a year's French he'd had in Terre Haute High School, bowed low and said, Eh bien, Madame Barzan, I know. Latouche cried, I know very well, Colonel Haricot. You think I, some mean old woman, steal government property from United States of America? 
she pouted at him. No, he replied cajolingly. Not steal, but you have it all the same, and I've got to get it back. What you think you take? Latouche asked, her chin stuck out. That electric generator, Haricot replied. Colonel Hensley gave me that. The colonel was taken aback by the name. He had no right to do that, he blustered. And I have it rebuilt, Latouche insisted. No damn good when I get it. Salvaged. See, I got bills right here. I know suppose you take that away, Colonel Haricot. Everything goes tomorrow morning. We start at nine o'clock. This stealing of government property has got to stop. He clicked his heels again and left. He would teach these Frenchmen a thing or two. Of course, we worked half the night hiding geographical indication gear all through the jungle. In the morning, Haricot appeared with his men and hauled away the odds and ends we had overlooked. But they did not take the generator. Latouche calmly loaded a marine revolver with American ball cartridges and stood guard over the power plant. Haricot studied her wryly for a moment and ordered his men elsewhere. When the work was completed, the colonel appeared in the salon. Gentlemen, he said dramatically, this place is now off limits. A guard has been posted. You will all leave. Sure enough, at the white picket fence, two soldiers stood guard with automatic rifles. The heat is on, an officer whispered to me. But that night we all sneaked back along the shore for dinner in the bare room. Latouche was pleasant and even happy. I just find out the colonel is not married. I think we have some very good fun with him. The fun started when the sergeant in charge of the guard applied to the colonel for permission to marry Mademoiselle Marthe de Beck. Who's she? the colonel asked. Some little tart? She is Madame Barzan's sister, sir. You mean up at the plantation? Yes, sir. Damn it all! I told you to guard the place, not invade it. How long has this been going on? I fell in love with her. What were you doing inside the gates? I was not inside the gates, sir. She came outside. That is after I went inside. What in the world goes on here? The confused colonel shouted. You jump in that jeep! Latouche greeted Haricot with demure attention. Something missing at the camp? she asked. Sir? the colonel bellowed at me. What are you doing here? Problem at the PT base, sir, I explained. Important business. Oh, the colonel replied. After all, it was customary for the Navy to have a lieutenant doing what a colonel did in the army. He studied me and then turned toward Latouche. Army in trouble, Colonel Haricot? she asked. This man says he wants to marry your sister. My sister, Laurencin. Noé, she called. Send Laurencin. It's Mart, the sergeant protested, but Latouche ignored him. You shut up, the colonel ordered. Soon Laurencin, blushing prettily, entered the room. She, like her sister, had a sprig of frangipani in her hair. What's this I hear, Laurencin? Latouche demanded abruptly. You fall in love with this boy? It's Mart, the sergeant protested. You be still! Haricot thundered. He was rather enjoying the scene. By heavens he could understand how the young fellow. Laurencin held up her frail hands. I never seen him before, she said. What's that? Haricot demanded. It's her sister, the sergeant said again. I know it's her sister, the colonel shouted. Oh! Latouche cried in mock embarrassment. Oh, Colonel Haricot! She gently pushed the colonel in the chest. Of course, my other sister, Noé, Ask Marthe to come in. She took the colonel by the arm and pressed quite closely to him. Come over to this chair, she suggested. It's warm today. When Marthe came in, there was no acting. She went to the sergeant and held his hand. Colonel Haricot, buttered up by now, smiled at the young girl. And what is your name? Marthe, the girl replied. And you want to marry my sergeant? Yes. Well, you can't do it, Haricot blustered. Too many marriages out here, bad for morale. This turn of events pleased Latouche highly. She did not want Mart marrying the first boy she met. As a matter of fact, Latouche had her eye on Haricot as a very proper husband for either Laurencin or Mart. He had money, was not ugly, and looked as if his wife could manage him pretty easily. You hear what the good American officer says, Mart? Latouche asked, shrugging her shoulders. You cannot get married. Latouche patted the sergeant on the arm. It's maybe better. Then she returned to Colonel Haricot and brushed against him several times. I suppose maybe it's best if the sergeant does not stand guard any more. My sisters are so pretty. 
Always the men fall in love with them. Ah, no, the guard remains. The colonel bowed stiffly, as he had seen Prussians do when delivering unpleasant ultimatums to French girls in the movies. Before we went to sleep that afternoon, I whispered, That is a mean trick. Mart is all right, Latouche replied, fluffing her hair across the pillow. Do her good. Girls got to learn about men. Got to learn fast these days. She laughed and started to hum. The last time I saw Paris. You better keep your eye on Mart, I said. The girl is in love. Skipper? she asked. What is Paris like in winter? Snow? I tried to recall. So far as I knew, it was just like any other city in the cold. I was about to say this when I remembered an opera I had seen in New York. La Boheme. A Spanish girl sang it. In the third act, I think this Spanish girl is trying to meet a soldier in a snowstorm. I told Latouche about it and the little guardhouse. She rose on one elbow. Her eyes flashed as if she actually saw Paris in the snow. When I stopped speaking, she cried, Oh, bus! And the wildness of her emotion made the little house creak until I was sure it could be heard in the salon. That night, Lieutenant Colonel Haricot returned to the plantation. I could guess what turmoil had brought him back. He said to himself, I will go back there and look the place over, see that the guards are on duty, see that everything is on the up and up. I am sure that is why he thought he was coming back. But when he entered the dining house and found a dinner party in progress, he was taken off guard. I... he sputtered a bit. Then he became ashamed of himself and his motives. He snapped to attention and said in low, harsh tones, Madame Barzon, if you do not quit this, I will close this joint up forever, and, he threatened darkly, I will close your two houses up there on the hill too. Like an angry cat, Latouche sprang at the man and slapped his face four times. Then she kicked him in the legs. I was the first at her side and pulled her away. Never say that, Colonel Haricot, she hissed, trembling in my arms. They not my houses. Next time I eliminate you. The colonel was astounded. He absolutely did not know what to think. He had never associated with women who slapped and kicked. He never met such women in Terre Haute. In his world, when a house was put off bounds, it was off bounds. No right-thinking officer would trespass. But here on Luana Pori, everything was different. Even officers ignored the rules of common decency. He turned sharply and left the dining room. At the wicket gate, he stopped and gave the sentry strict orders to shoot if any officers tried to leave the plantation. Then he drove hurriedly down the road. He can raise plenty of trouble, the captain said. He not gonna do nothing, Latouche replied. Why are you so sure? The colonel all messed up inside, Latouche said simply. She reached over and patted Laurencin's hand. He get himself fixed up pretty soon. He is all right. At that moment, Colonel Haricot was pacing up and down his bare office at the base. He was trying to dictate an order arresting all military personnel at the plantation. The words would not come. Oh, go to bed, he told his typist. What was it after all? He asked himself. I insulted a young woman and she slapped my face. I never insulted a woman before in my life. My mother taught me better than that. That girl had a right to slap me. He began to build up a pretty impressive case for Latouche. But he knew that his authority was being flouted and he loved authority. Corporal, he shouted. That sleepy fellow came back to the bare office. Oh, go on back to bed, the colonel said. Wish he would make up his mind, the corporal muttered. I am sorry, the colonel shouted. Deep within him, a voice kept saying over and over, they were having a good time, and I am not having a good time. I have never had any fun since I left high school in Terra Haute. Maybe they sing after dinner. Or maybe they just sit around and talk. There was nothing wrong there tonight, and they were having a good time. I will go back and apologise, he said firmly. That is what Mother would tell me to do. I was terribly rude up there. I will go back and apologise. Corporal, Corporal. At the gate, the sentry challenged him. It is me, Colonel Haricot. Anybody leave yet? Oh, no, sir. Pretty scared in there, I guess? Oh, yes, sir. When Haricot arrived, we were all in the salon. The officers rose and bowed. Haricot was in his early forties and fat. His rump was quite round and bobbed grotesquely when he clicked his heels before Latouche. I have come to apologise, he said simply. I acted like a fool. 
Latouche rose, extended her lovely hand and forgave him. She managed to brush against him hesitatingly as she did so. Colonel Haricot made a motion as if he wished to sit down and apologise further, but Latouche had foreseen this. Gently twining her arm in his, she said, I am so sorry, Colonel Haricot. After you so nice to come back this way, I have engagement with the pilot here. Whereupon, with no further comment, she grabbed my arm and led me from the salon. Outside she sprang into activity. Noé, she called in a low voice. Hurry, find Laurentin. When that frail girl, then only seventeen, came up, Latouche hurriedly adjusted her sister's dress, straightened the flowers in her hair and kissed her. Look pretty, she whispered. She patted Laurentin's hips, fluffed up the frills of her dress. Now, you big chance! She half slapped, half pushed the hesitating Laurentin toward the salon door where Colonel Haricot was preparing to leave. Good luck, Laurentin, she whispered. This your big chance! A few days later, the guard was removed. This was a mistake, because one night the plantation was aroused by shooting. Latouche and I had already gone to bed. Colonel Haricot was in the garden with Laurentin. I hastily dressed and went out toward the sound of the shooting. To my surprise, I found a naval officer in the salon. An enlisted man was arguing with him, trying to get a revolver away from him. Where's the girls? the officer bellowed. Come on, Lieutenant Harbison, the enlisted driver begged. Don't pull me, son, the drunken officer cried. He waved his gun at the serious enlisted man. Then, seeing me, he lurched across the salon to greet me. Where's the girls? he demanded. There are no girls here, I said. Don't give me that. I know you flyers. Keep everything for yourself. I know you. Girls used to be here, plenty of them. He banged into a post as I sidestepped him. The bamboo walls shook. Latouche appeared at this moment. There she is! Harbison cried. You remember me, baby? That time the PBY went down. You remember me? Throw him out, bus, Latouche said quietly. You try to throw me out, Harbison bellowed. Nothing but a goddamn whorehouse. I know you, sister. I know you. I leapt at the intruder, but he saw me coming. With a quick football manner, he sidestepped me, tripped me, and smashed me in the face as I went down. The revolver butt knocked my jaw loose, and I fainted. About three o'clock in the morning I came to. I was in Latouche's little house, on the bed, and I had the strangest feeling. My jaw was numb. The army doctor had shot it full of cocaine, and I thought I heard my old friend Tony Fry talking from a great distance. I should never have brought that foul ball down here, Tony was saying, but do not worry. Latouche and the enlisted man beat him up. Swell job. My eyes closed with pain and Tony patted me on the head. You tried, bus, he said, but you should see what the enlisted man did to Harbison. Latouche helped too. Later that night, when the room was empty, I heard Tony's voice again. He was talking to Latouche in that quiet, earnest way he had. He was saying in French, Paris is the city most lovely. I went there with my mother as a little boy. And I knew by the silence that I would never sleep with Latouche again. The pain in my heart grew greater than the hurt in my face. I tried to bury myself beneath the covers, but the army doctor had them pinned to the sheets. When I awoke next morning, a French woman about twenty-five was fixing the room. Who are you? I asked through clenched teeth. Lisette, she replied. What are you doing here? Latouche, she bring me up early this morning. What for? For take care of you, Mr. Bus. She motioned to an army cot. Where'd you get that? Colonel Haricot. He bring it up last night. Lisette was pretty, plump and kind. Her husband was in Africa. Had not been heard from since Beer Hakeim. She knew what a man down from the islands needed. They moved us out of Latouche's bedroom in about a week. When I could get around again, I looked up two old parachutes for Lisette, one red, one white. I did not see either Tony or Latouche for three days after the brawl. They went to live in a little house near the edge of the jungle. Noé took them food. Finally they came to see me. They motioned Lisette out of the room. Fry looked at me and said nothing. Latouche stood far from the bed and said in a hurried sing-song voice, I sorry, bus. You one good man. I wish I had a man like you, a good fighter. Tony tell me about you at Munda, what you do. I wish we meeting for the first time, bus. No other husband, no other wife. I sorry, bus. 
At night I would hear Tony at the small piano, picking out French tunes and themes from the operas. When the salon was empty, when Colonel Haricot's jeep had left, I would see Latouche dancing by herself among the chairs, while Tony worked the small army radio Colonel Haricot had given Laurencin. Come back to bed, Lisette would snap in French. Leave them alone. Now Latouche has herself a man. I could not drag myself from spying. God, I do not know how I felt. But I would hear Lisette's soft voice again in English. Coming back to bed, bus. It's her affair. I should have stopped Tony right then. I knew he was fascinated by Latouche. But I never guessed at what would happen. With the rest of us? Well, you know how it was. The girls were there. They were lonely. We had lots of money and navy gear. It was a nice life. But with Tony it was different. He learned to speak a little Javanese. He went everywhere with Latouche as she supervised the plantation. Did not show up at camp for days in a row. They sat on a bench in the garden and he read to her. Latouche, I had never seen her the way she was then. She told him the history of the islands, how her father had come there as a boy. They talked in French, in English, and in broken Javanese. At night a light would burn in her little house till almost morning. Our drowsy routine was broken when we found that Mart was going to have a baby. That sergeant! Latouche sniffled. That goddamn sergeant! Well, I said. I told you this would happen. Oh, you! she shouted hoarsely. What could that do now? She pulled Mart tenderly into a big chair made of teakwood. How this thing happen? she asked softly. I love him, Mart replied in French. Sure you love him, Latouche agreed. We always do, but how you do it? Mart buried her head on her sister's shoulder. Latouche rocked her back and forth. How you do this thing, she whispered. We get a room in the greenhouse, Mart said. Latouche sprang to her feet and threw Mart to the floor. She kicked the pregnant girl and jumped upon her, slapping her face. Then, in great fury, she dashed to her bedroom and returned with her revolver. I dived at her and caught her by the wrist. I wrenched the revolver from her. She panted heavily for a moment and then said, We go now, bus. I followed her to the jeep Colonel Haricot had loaned her. She climbed in. We drove to the greenhouse. Eight or ten cars stood outside. Latouche left the jeep and strode up to the door. Inside we could hear the cheap piano and sounds of dancing. Latouche pushed the door wide open. The girls inside gasped as they saw her flashing beauty. It is Madame Barzon, they whispered and drew back along the wall. Latouche surveyed the garish room. Then, seeing the madame in a plush chair, she walked up, grabbed the plump, middle-aged woman by the shoulders and dragged her to her feet. Damned fool! Latouche hissed. She slapped the woman's face eight or ten times and gave her a brutal shove in the stomach. The whimpering madame fell backward into the chair. Latouche scowled over her. Good thing the officer take away my gun. I terminate you for sure. My sister in here. She turned slowly and studied the room and its occupants. We go, she said. Back at the plantation, Latouche sought Mart and told her she was sorry. She placed her arm about the lovely little girl and began to cry a little. Is no good, she mumbled. All this love-making with soldiers. Somebody get hurt. This time maybe it's you. How long you gone, Mart? Three months, the fifteen-year-old girl replied. Oh, mon Dieu, Latouche sighed. Well, what we can do, Tony? What you think? We make her get married? We usually do in America, Tony replied. We call it compounding the error. From the snorts and puffings outside, we judged that Colonel Haricot had arrived with the offending sergeant, whom he was giving some sound abuse. He entered the salon in the grand manner, bowed low to Latouche, and tenderly approached Mart as if the poor child were already encouched. Well, he shouted at the embarrassed sergeant, what are you going to do about it? I want to marry her, the sergeant said, stepping hedge his pale sweetheart. It's about time, the colonel snorted. Then he magnanimously grasped the sergeant's hand, adding in a voice of great emotion, It's good to see a decent fellow play the man. The sergeant was bewildered. He had wanted to marry Mart from the first day he had seen her. At this moment, Laurencin entered the salon. The colonel looked at her briefly and dropped his head, blushing furiously. We are going to be married too, he said. Oh, Colonel Haricot, Latouche cried, as if she alone in the salon were surprised at this astonishing news. As senior naval officer present, I was very crisp, very proper. 
I extended the congratulations of my service. I do not know what they will say in Terre Haute, Haricot chuckled. But to the devil with them, whatever they say. You know, gentlemen, I have had more fun in this house, more honest to John Fun. That is true of a lot of us, Colonel, Fry said. It's awful to think of leaving this plantation, Haricot confided. Moving north? Yep, he replied. I wrote to my mother about Laurent Saint, her being half Javanese, you know. Mum was very broad-minded. Been giving money to missions all her life. A Baptist, Mum is. She said if she had given all that money to save souls, she guessed some of them must be saved by now. He nudged me and grinned broadly. Get it? he asked. But the colonel put his foot down when a double wedding was suggested. After all, he observed righteously, there is a difference, a considerable difference. What it was that constituted the difference, his rank as compared with the sergeant's or Laurencin's virginity as compared with Marta's family status, I never knew. Latouche took me aside after the colonel had left and begged me to get her three old parachutes, one red, one yellow and one white. I can't just go out and steal parachutes, I protested. You got two for Lisette, she reminded me, but she was special. I not something special, she asked, pirouetting. She twirled near me and I tried to pull her into the shadows. She pushed me away. You Tony's friend, I think, she said. Then ask Tony to get the parachutes. I can't, Bus. I want to surprise Tony. She ran her fingers down my shirt sleeve, and I knew I was in the parachute business. Lieutenant Colonel Haricot and Laurent Saint were married in the salon. An island missionary, a Baptist, officiated. Tony Fry was best man. I gave the bride away. As always, I had tears in my eyes. I am a sucker for a wedding. Latouche, in a simple white store dress, stood inconspicuously with her sister. But at the reception, Latouche appeared in the doorway dressed in shimmering parachute silk. We all gasped. Not even if I was drunk could I imagine a girl so beautiful. She had taken my three old shoots and cut them into many pointed strips. Do you know parachute silk? Soft as a baby's breath. Well, she had made herself a sweeping gown that measured more than twenty-five yards around the hem. Yet the silk was so delicate that it came to a thin band about her tiny waist. She wore a bodice that seemed nothing at all. Up here she was framed in silk, and we did not look at much but Latouche that night. Strange, but the clashing red and yellow colours blended delicately against her golden skin. You were mine once, baby, I whispered to myself. As she passed me in the salon, she pressed my hand and said in a hushed voice, Meet me by the shed, please. My heart thumped as I hastened down a dark path which led to the little huts in which the Javanese workmen lived. Latouche was waiting for me in the shadows. To my dismay, Tony was with her. A surprise, she said. There, ahead of us, in a hollow square formed by two huts, the shed and a bamboo screen, the local Buddhists had set up a temple. They were holding sacred ceremonials to honour the marriage of Marc de Beck and her American sergeant. In the darkness, two teak logs had been placed upright about twenty feet apart. Between them were nailed three wide teak planks, one above the other, to form an altar. White cloths were placed over each plank. Candles flickered on the topmost cloth. Four bronze objects, like plates, glistened on the lower planks. On a finely woven mat in front of the altar, an old Buddhist priest in white pants and black silk coat knelt and prayed. On either side of him, sitting cross-legged, were two other Javanese, also in black. One hammered a small drum in irregular rhythms. The other tapped a tinkling bell at intervals. In time, the drum and the bell filled our minds and seemed to echo all about us. We sat upon the ground. In ghastly and uncertain light from flickering candles, Marthe and the sergeant stood before the priest. Women from the plantation, Javanese prostitutes from the two houses, and old men from the cacao bins moaned in the night. The drum and bell beat on. The priest rose and blessed the couple before him. Upon Mart he placed the special blessing of fertility, a kind of priestly second guessing. An old Javanese next to Tony explained the meaning of the rites. Fry, who was learning the language, replied sagely. The drum beat on. The tinkling bell haunted my ears when I became aware of a disturbance behind me. Suddenly there was shouting in Javanese and then bold words in French. Mon Dieu! Latouche cried and became pale. This is it! Fry whispered, licking his thin lips. 
Into the holy place strode a gaunt Frenchman. Achille Barzan was down from the hills. Idolaters! he shouted. Thieves! Adulterers! He rushed toward the altar and knocked it over. Then, seeing Latouche in her brilliant dress, he lunged at her. I interceded. Barzan struck me with a heavy club. I stumbled backward. I thought my arm was broken. Seeing this, Latouche screamed and rushed from the enclosure. Her flowing gown caught in the bamboo screen and pulled it down. Her flying skirt flashing in the candlelight, she rushed up the hill to the safety of her white house. Although my arm was aching, I tried to stop Barzan. I made a football dive for him but bumped into Tony Fry instead. If I had been quicker on my feet, I might have stopped a tragedy. For Latouche did not reach her room in time to lock the door. In a wild burst of fury, Achille Barzan pushed his way into the White House. Swinging his club over his head, he lunged at his wife. There were four pistol shots. Barzan, stumbling backward, clutched twice at the stars and fell dead. In the long questioning that ensued, Lieutenant Colonel Haricot was superb. The French interrogators liked him. He had a French name and could speak their language badly enough to win both their respect and pity. He was also a moral man, a man of sentiment. He insisted that Latouche had acted in self-defence, that she was a proper and well-brought-up girl, that Achille Barzan was a bully and a tyrant, that Achille was a dirty man and a pettiniste as well. Nothing to do with the case, the commissioner said. It shows he was without honour, Haricot insisted. The colonel spoke for both Tony and me. We were not allowed to testify, for example, that we even knew where her room was, I was not asked if I had heard her threaten to eliminate two different persons, nor did I speak about her wish that her husband was dead. No, we were model witnesses. Had Tony Fry been a frequent visitor at the plantation? He had. Was he what you might call? Oh no, he was not. Had he ever, what you might say? Never. Then, Colonel, what was he doing at the plantation? The Colonel blustered and asked Fry what he was doing there, learning to speak Javanese. Could the lieutenant speak a little Javanese? He could and he would. What did the lieutenant say, interpreter? He said, Copra will stay high if the United States keeps on buying. At this point, Colonel Haricot pointed out four facts. Had Achille Barzan threatened his wife? He had. Had he tried to break the American pilot's arm? He had. Had he raised club to strike his wife? Nine witnesses saw that. Had she shot him in self-defence? Obviously. Bien. What can one say, especially when this fellow Haricot keeps talking all the time? Well, Commissioner? Well, yes. Of course, Madame Barzan must be arrested, yes. A mere formality. Colonel Haricot's testimony has already taken care of that. When news of the tragedy reached old Papa Barzan in prison, he went wild with sorrow and cursed Latouche far into the night. He screamed that his son had met her in Pink House in Noumea, that she was an evil devil. But the old fellow was deranged. That is clear from what happened a few days later when he heard that Latouche had been released. The old man backed up and dashed himself against the wall four times until he broke his neck. Of course, Colonel Haricot had to leave Luana Pori. He had, in a sense, disgraced the army, marrying a half-caste, mixed up in a murder. He kissed Laurent Saint lovingly before he left and prayed to God that he left in her womb a daughter as lovely as she. Josephine Sailor came up here to Canora. He helped to make our beachhead against the Japanese. One night he almost went mad, for he saw among the coconut trees torn and blasted by the shell fire, one that bent toward him like the slim Javanese girl on Luana Pori. They gave him permission later to fly back and marry her. Marta's sergeant was not so lucky. He stopped a bullet in the surf right out there where you are looking. A friend who had raised hell when the sergeant married Mart saw him bouncing face down on the coral and thought, maybe he was not so dumb. My own life was disrupted when the colonel left. That same day, Lisette received a cablegram from Rome. Her husband had been rescued from a prison camp. He was with the Americans in Rome. An old man brought the cable, and Lisette started to cry. I paid the old man and sent him away. He will get through all right now, I know, Lisette whimpered in French. Dear God, I prayed so hard for him. Tears flooded her eyes and she could say nothing. She patted my arm. She wiped her face. She took my handkerchief and blew her nose. I got to leave, bus. I gonna be a good wife now, she said. Of the lovers at the plantation, only Latouche and Tony remained. 
Like children lost in a dream of Christmas, they wandered about the gardens and the beaches. I came upon them one day, far below on the white coral. Latouche wore nothing, simply that golden slim and twisting in the shallow water. It was then that I too left the plantation and started to pack. I knew we were moving north to Kuralay. I had done little more than get the jeeps and bulldozers ready for the ship when Tony came to see me. You in trouble? I asked when I saw his grave face. Holy cow, no, he replied, breaking into a fine smile. Bus, I want you to be my best man. I took a deep breath, looked at the shadows under the palm trees, then at Tony. He was dressed in dirty slacks, sneakers and a sun helmet. He looked like a beachcomber, a very special beachcomber. La Touche? I asked. Yes. But Tony, they won't grant you permission. Not after what happened. I am not asking for any permission. What are you going to do? The Buddhist priest, Saturday night. Nobody needs to know a thing. But the Navy. Nobody needs to know. My head was a bit dizzy. God knows I knew what a man felt out there on that plantation. The long days, the ocean, the jungle creeping up on you, and that little white house, the laughter of living girls. But marriage? An old fool like Haricot from Terre Haute, or a sailor from Boston, maybe. But Tony Fry. Listen, Tony, I pleaded. You got hot pants. So have I. So has everybody else. But you do not have to marry the girl. Bus, Tony said softly. If you were not my best friend and you said that, well, I'd bust you one in the mouth. Smiling, he suddenly whipped his right fist up from his knees. But remembering my tender jaw, he pulled his punch and hit me beside the head. We stumbled into a chair. You got it bad, Tony, I mumbled. I want you for my best man. I'm getting married. It won't stand up in court, I said, rubbing my head. You're just kidding yourself and the girl. Now look, bus, Tony said very quietly. I know what I want. I'm a big boy, see? All my life I've seen guys looking for the girl they wanted, hungry guys growing old, empty inside. Bus, this girl is for me. She fills me up, to overflowing. This is it. If you take her back to the States, everyone will think she's a Japanese. I won't, and maybe I don't back to the States. I like this life, the hot afternoons and cool nights like these islands. I have got some cash. Maybe life here is what I have been looking for. This Pacific will be the centre of the new world. This is our future. Well, I am part of it. This is for me. Tony, you are forcing me, I said. What do you know about the pink house in Noumea? You tell me, bus. What do you think, honestly? You asked for it, Tony. Here it is. You do not know Latouche. That Achille Barzan deal. Do you know she dreamed of his death? That she prayed for his death? The girl is a little better than a murderess. I am sorry, Fry, but there it is. Tony rubbed his nose to hide the fact that he was laughing. Bus, he chuckled. You are lovely guy. That Achille Barzan deal, as you call it. What would you say if I told you that Latouche and I planned every step? For days and days. Natives reported each day where Barzan was hiding. We paid them to let Barzan overhear that Mart was getting married. When and where. We knew he was coming. We considered six different ways of doing him in. I wanted to shoot him myself. Take a general court. Self-defence. Latouche could join me later. But she figured a better way. She knew he hated her because she went on being a Buddhist. Same time she was a Catholic. We knew Barzan would try to break up the wedding. So it was all an act. No, it was real. Your arm was almost broken, was not it? He tried to take her life with a club, didn't he? Just as we planned it. I laughed at myself. And I was running like a fool to try to save her. From Achille. Boy, oh boy. Tony grinned at me in that silly old way of his. We figured on that too, Bus. We knew you were sentimental, that you liked to protect women. We knew you would try to catch Achille before he reached the door. Why do you suppose I bumped you when you started to chase him? Did you think you stumbled? We looked at one another across the dusty jeeps and bulldozers there along the shore. Tony dragged out some papers. How about signing them for me, Bus? I leafed through them. Statements to his bank that Latouche de Beck Barzon Fry was his lawful wife. A will. A letter to his insurance agent. The usual stuff. I witnessed them for him, sealed them in an envelope and censored it. That Saturday night the moon was full. You know how it rises out of the jungle on such nights. First a glow, then the trees burst into flame. 
and finally the tallest ones stand like charred stumps against the moon itself. In the moonlight, with the drum beating and the little bell ringing, Tony married the girl. I kissed the bride and hurried back to the fighter strip. I could not think. To hell with dinners and Luana Pori and crazy men like Tony Fry and women like Latouche. I was sort of tied up inside. You fellows know what to do in a case like that. Even though it was against orders, I revved up a plane and took off, into the darkness. But when I was over the jungle and out across the ocean, the moon made everything bright and wonderful. I flew back very high. Below me was the plantation, just a sliver chopped out of the dark jungle. I could see the salon, the little house Lisette and I had, Latouche's sleeping house, the white fence. I dived and buzzed the place until my ears rang. I would give them a wedding present. You know what a plane does for you at a time like that. You can climb and twist. It is like playing God, and when you come down, you can sleep. On Sunday, the ship came to take us north. I hurried out to the plantation to get Fry. I found him sitting on a bench among the flowers. Latouche, in a skimpy brassiere and shorts, lay with her head in his lap. He was reading Chinese Lee to her. This book says the future of America is with Asia, Latouche said in French. You know, bus? Tony began. This guy is right. You wait. We will all be out here again. We will be fighting China or India or Malaysia. Asia's never going to let Australia stay white. Bus, if you are smart, you will move out here somewhere. This is the crossroads of the world from now on. Time's up, I said. Tony closed the book and looked at me. Bus, Latouche said softly. Get me one flower for my hair. I picked for her a flamboyant. It was too big. I take one piece of that green and yellow grass, she said. She wore it at a cocky angle. The ship is in, I said. Well, she replied. It got to come some time. I will go pack, Tony said. Latouche shrugged her shoulders and followed him across the garden. In her evanescent clothes, she was a dream, not a girl at all. She was the symbol of what men think about in lonely places. Her buttocks did not bounce like those of tramps in Scollet Square, nor heave like those of fat and virtuous dowagers. Her shoulders stayed in a straight line as she walked. Her black hair blew lightly over her shoulder. Her legs were slim and resolute, an anchorage in the ocean of any guy's despair. She disappeared into the tiny house. Well, you know what happened. We moved up to Santo and waited there a while. It always makes me laugh when I see a war movie. The hero and his buddy get on a ship in Frisco and right away land on the beachhead, where the buddy gets dead and the hero wipes out four Japanese emplacements. You get on the ship at Frisco, all right, but you get off at Luana Pori. You wait there a couple of months. You move up to Santo and wait some more. At Guadalcanal you wait, and in the Russells. But the day finally comes when even a moron can see that the next move. It was now midsummer. The sun blazed directly overhead, and at times it seemed as if we could stand the heat no longer, but we had to work, for a strike was in progress. Upon us depended the success of Alligator, the great Kuralai operation. So all through the steaming hell of January and February we worked on, each day a few men would find their prickly heat unbearable and would have to be hospitalised, or fungus would break out in their ears, or athlete's foot would incapacitate them. Incessant glare of sun on coral sent some to the hospital until their eyes recovered, and once or twice men keeled over for no reason. We sluiced them off with cold water and sent them to bed for the day, but mostly we worked on. I was in a strange navy. I saw two major strikes, and yet I never set foot upon what you would call a real warship. I was as true a naval officer as circumstances would permit, and yet I never saw a battleship except from a considerable distance. I never even visited a carrier, or a cruiser, or a destroyer. I never saw a submarine. I was a new type of naval officer. I was the man who messed around with aircraft, PT boats, landing barges, and the vast shore establishment. For a long period, Prior to the actual landings on Kuralai and before the attack on Kenora, I served as Admiral Kester's representative at the Naval Supply Depot, which was to provision the fleet serving in those operations. I left Noumea with trepidation, for I had never before worked with the men who labour in silence behind the front, hauling, shoving and bickering among themselves. It now became my duty to help the housekeepers of the Navy. The depot to which I was thus attached was located along the southern edge of an extensive channel. Much of the fleet could have been stationed there, 
but we got only the supply boats and small craft that provision larger units. At times, we would have as many as 120 ships in our channel, ships from all over the world. They brought our depot a massive supply of goods of war. Some of the cargoes they carried were strange, and illustrated better than words the nature of modern war. Three ships came in one week loaded mostly with paper. We built a special warehouse for it, 200 feet long and 65 feet wide. In it we had a wilderness of paper. One man did nothing but take care of brown manila envelopes. That was all he did for 21 months. Yet into those envelopes went the plans, the records, the resumes of the world's greatest fleet. We had another man whose sole responsibility was pens, ink, paper clips and coloured pencils. This man came to his tropical job from Minnesota. He had sores in his armpits for almost 18 months. Then he went back to Minnesota. Seabees had constructed the depot. It consisted of an area two miles long, a mile deep. Two hundred odd Quonset huts were laid out in neat rows along the shoreline of the channel. Three thousand men worked at the depot. One entire company of Seabees did nothing but oil the coral to keep dust down. Ten men had no responsibility but to mend watches as they arrived from ship and aircraft navigators. Sixteen men were bakers, and all night long, every night for two years, they made bread and sometimes cake. We had two docks at the depot, and a special road paralleling the shoreline up and down which rolled trucks day and night, seven days a week, month upon month. The drivers were all coloured men, and their commanding officer permitted them to paint their trucks with fanciful names, the Dixie Flyer, the Mississippi Cannonball, Harlem Hotspot, and Coconut Express. More gear lay on the hot coral than ever we got into the buildings. Twelve men walked among this gear day after day, endlessly, from one pile to another. They checked it to see that rainwater was not seeping through the tarpaulins. They also guarded against mosquitoes that might breed in stagnant pools behind the stacks. There were no days at the depot. Sunday was not observed, nor was there day itself, as many men worked at night as did during daylight hours. In this work, strange things happened. Two truckloads of jewellers' gear would be lost, completely lost. Trucks, invaluable watches, hairsprings, all records, gone. Then, three months later, the gear would be found at some place like Noumea or San Diego. It was futile even to guess at what had happened. All you knew was that one night, about three, that jewellers' gear was in the depot. You saw it there. Now it was in San Diego. Constantly, in a stream that varied only in size, officers and men from the fleet came to the depot. They came with chits, signed always by some nebulous authority whom they considered sound, but whom the men at the depot had never heard of. We got to have 2,000 feet of grade A wire, a seaman would plead urgently. Give him 1,200 feet. There was no appeal. We need four more gas stoves. Give him three. Skipper says we got to have two more Aldis lamps. Where you headed? North. OK, give him two. In two weeks you heard every possible excuse for getting equipment. You became calloused and looked at everyone as if he were a crook. At church, if you went, you wondered, what is he saying that for? What is it he wants? Suspicious, charged with heavy responsibility, eager to see the fleet go forth well armed, but knowing the men of the fleet were a gang of robbers, you worked yourself dizzy and knocked off 25% from each request. If to the above characteristics you added a capacity to do twice as much work as other naval officers, a willingness to connive and battle endlessly for what you wanted, and an absolute love of red tape, you were a real supply officer. Captain Samuel Kelly, 54 years old, 5 feet 4, 149 pounds, native of Madison, Wisconsin, graduate of Annapolis, was a supply officer. He was a small man of tireless energy and brilliant mind. He would have succeeded in anything he tried. Had he stayed in the regular line of the Navy, he would surely have become an admiral in command of a task force. Slightly defective hearing made such a career impossible. It was a good bet, however, that he would one day be admiral in charge of the supply corps. It was Captain Kelly that I came north to work with. I was taller than he, so that when I reported, I tended to stoop a bit in his presence. His first words to me were, Stand at attention. Put your hat under your left arm, and never wear an aviator's cap in this depot. Captain Kelly had a mania against aviators' baseball caps. Men in the air arm of the Navy loved the tight-fitting, comfortable little caps. And when Mark Mitcher started wearing one, 
it was difficult to keep the entire navy from following suit. But no men serving under Captain Kelly wore baseball caps. He issued the order on the day he arrived to take charge of the depot. Next day, he put two enlisted men in the brig. The day following, he confined an officer to quarters for four days. After that, we learned our lesson. Captain Kelly instituted other innovations as well. The depot was a supply activity. Quickly, officers of the regular line found themselves ousted from good jobs and relegated to minor posts. Several of the line officers demoted were civilians at heart and had no concern with their naval future. They protested the captain's decision. Within three days, they received orders elsewhere and took with them unsatisfactory recommendations that would forever prevent them from being promoted in the Navy. The captain's principal innovations, however, concerned free time, entertainment and recreation. Each morning we would see him outside his quarters doing ten push-ups, twenty stomach bends. He was in much better physical condition than his junior officers, a fact which gave point to his subsequent actions. First he lengthened the working day. Daytime hands reported to work at seven. They worked till twelve. After one hour off they worked until seventeen. One night in eight, they worked all night and had the next day to sleep. This meant a 63-hour week, with the thermometer at 95 or more. Two officers made formal protests. Unfortunately, they were line officers and were transferred. Shortly after this protest, the captain made another announcement. All games were cancelled. The men can rise an hour earlier if they wish. They can do setting up exercises. All this time off for games is unnecessary. The devil finds work for idle hands. So all games, except crap and poker, were abandoned. On the night of the day athletic schedules were discarded, some toughies cheered the captain as he entered the moving picture area. He promptly turned, ordered the lights extinguished and the movie operators to their quarters. We had no shows for a week, and in that time all seats in the movie area were torn out. Coconut logs were strung along the ground for men to sit upon. When the movies were reopened, the same toughies cheered again. The entire depot was restricted to quarters, and for a month we had no shows. By that time, saga councils prevailed among the men, and when movies were resumed, there were no cheers. From then on, officers and men alike met the captain with stony silence. If he came into the club, all present stood at attention until he was seated. No one spoke above a whisper until he left. The Navy ashore is too lenient the captain told us one day at dinner. A great movement is on. I have been sent here to bring some kind of discipline into this organisation. I propose to do so. We will shortly be faced with responsibilities almost beyond our capacity to perform. At that time there will be no place for weaklings. That was the first news his subordinates had that a strike was scheduled. It was tremendous news. From then on speculation never ceased as to where the strike would be directed. Men argued until late at night the relative merits of Truk, Rabaul, Kaviang, and Kurale. Strong spirits advocated Kurale. Weaker men shuddered at all four. In the course of this discussion, I discovered two interesting facts. The first was that most of the Supply Corps officers did not give a damn about the strike. They never argued about when it would hit or where. Their concern was in how many bolts would be needed, how much gasoline. Yet when the final score was tallied, I repeatedly found that it was these indifferent officers who had made the strike possible. Details entrusted to the agitators and debaters might go awry, but not the fine-spun responsibilities of the dry, uninterested supply men. My second discovery was much more challenging. I found that I was the only man at the depot who was sure where the strike was headed. Not even Captain Kelly knew. I used my discovery as only a mean man would. I sat next to the captain at mess and frequently felt the steel of his impartial goad. He disliked me, but not particularly. I was another undisciplined line officer, but what was worse, a reserve, a mountebank, a huckster, a dry goods salesman. I once heard Captain Kelly describe a reserve officer who joined the Navy from a large Cleveland store. I had no illusions as to what he thought of me. When he called me to his office and told me that as long as I was attached to his staff I would report to work at 7, not 7.02, he added icily, Perhaps the training will stand you in good stead when you return to business life. Therefore, when I found myself with a weapon in my hands, I used it like a bludgeon rather than as a rapier. 
At least once each day I would refer to some admiral. I am not sure that Admiral Kester even remembers my name. I was merely his messenger. But at the depot one would have thought that Admiral Kester and I were, well, that he consulted me before making any decision. Whenever I mentioned him or Admiral Nimitz, whom I saw once at a distance, or Admiral this or Admiral that, I looked right at Captain Kelly. He knew the game I was playing, but he could not tell whether or not I was bluffing. If I really did know some admirals, then later on I might be able to hinder his progress in the Navy. He had to be careful how he handled me. On this battleground, Captain Kelly and I arranged a truce. He left me to myself. I did not undermine him with his own affairs. It was this armistice that made life bearable for me. And the structure of the armistice was my snide, mean, contemptible insinuation week after week that I knew where the strike was directed, and he did not. I never said as much, but I certainly devised a hundred means of imparting that suggestion to Captain Kelly. My plan of battle did not endear me with my fellow officers who groaned and sweated under the captain's saddle. They called me Old Mini Admiral. They were a bit envious. I tried to be a good sport about it and affected never to know what they meant. I was therefore most pleased when an old friend of mine was assigned to the depot for additional duty in connection with the strike. Lieutenant Bus Adams was older than I and a world roostabout. He was a pilot and in the recent fighting over Kenora had been banged up a bit. As relief from further firing duties, he was sent to the depot to advise on aviation details. He reported to the captain with a dirty aviation cap under his left arm. Those caps are not permitted in the depot, Captain Kelly said sharply. I have wings, sir, Bus replied. Mr. Adams, I determine the uniform here. Bus did not acknowledge the rebuff, nor did he stop wearing the baseball cap. Slouched over his left ear, it became a badge of freedom around the depot. For some hidden reason, perhaps like the reasons which protected my special privileges, Captain Kelly refrained from forcing the issue with Adams. He used subtler methods. At meals, which I remember as a horrible experience, the captain would relate one story after another of naval aviators who had been disciplined, broken, returned to civilian life. He spoke of courts-martial, inefficiencies, thefts and other discrepancies until one would have judged all aviation personnel to be subnormal and a menace. Day after day we heard these sallies directed at bus. Adams refused to let the captain get under his skin. Instead, he would make ultra-polite conversation in which some aviator always won the war single-handed. He was especially fond of an off-hand reference to Billy Mitchell or the Prince of Wales and the Repulse. His choicest barbs were usually unpremeditated. Once he said, I suppose Seversky will replace Mahan in the next generation at Annapolis. Captain Kelly actually slobbered his coffee at that remark. A much more telling blow was also offhand. Adams observed one day that disposition of one's forces was of paramount importance. For example, a squadron of twenty good fighters aloft at Pearl Harbor would probably have kept ten American warships from being sunk. A few other officers were also strong enough to ignore Captain Kelly. Most of them were reserve line officers. They were as far in the Navy as they would ever get. They loved the service, but had no illusions as to their worth. They were classified AVS, which meant Aviation Volunteer Specialist, but which everyone knew meant After Victory Scram. One very wealthy ensign in communications merely waited, for peace and a return to Long Island. He viewed Captain Kelly as one might have viewed any other temporary plague. The other officers had to bear the captain's cold furies. They would sit at their desks and pray for nine to pass. Generally speaking, if Captain Kelly did not upset the depot and publicly excoriate his assistants by nine in the morning, they were safe for the day. Usually they were not so lucky. Some minor defect at their work would be discovered by the captain, and before everyone in the earshot, the culprit would be humiliated. Day after day, Captain Kelly raged and stormed at his officers. Frequently, the cause, if ignored, would have been forgotten by noon. As it was, however, there grew up in the depot a clique of eight or ten officers who daily sought to divert the captain's wrath from themselves by pointing out someone else's mistakes. In this way, officer was set against officer, and there developed an atmosphere of hatred deeper than any in which I had previously lived. No defection, however small, escaped attention. Like boys before a whipping post, 
the officers would breathe easily because it was someone else that morning, not they. Bus Adams refused to play any part in that dirty game. Several times he took the blame for petty discrepancies, which it would have been beneath the dignity of a naval aviator to dispute. Hell, he used to say to me, why should I dirty my hands in that foul stew? What can that bunch of sisters do to me? Next month I will be tangling with zeros. I cannot waste my energy on the supply corps. But next month never came. Instead, one dismal incident after another occurred, until I wondered whether I was working with men or children. One especially petty affair will explain what I mean. Captain Kelly's incipient deafness made it necessary for him to ask that certain conversation be repeated. What is that, Mr. Adams? he would say, leaning forward slightly. Bus, accordingly, made it a point to drop his voice at the last sentence of any interesting comment he was making. What is that, Mr. Adams? the captain would ask in his bird-like manner. Then Bus would shout something proving that aviators alone were saving the Navy. I remember once when his bellowed reply was, He flunked out of flight training, so they found him a job in the supply corps. Another time he echoed, We would have sunk two more Japanese ships, but we ran out of supplies. Bus could speak like Charles Lawton, the actor who portrayed Captain Bly in Mutiny on the Bounty. Frequently, when he had two or three whiskies safely stowed, he would thrust his lower jaw out, walk like a martinet on the bridge, and stick his face into mine. What is that, Mr. Christian? He would sneer in the manner of the great slave driver. Bus repeated this performance often enough so that enlisted men finally got wind of it. Then, for several weeks, two hundred warehouses rang with the battle cry, What's that, Mr. Christian? Then for Christian, the luckless mutineer, was substituted the name of any officer who might at that moment be under Captain Kelly's heel. What's that, Mr. Adams? would come bursting forth from some dark building. In mock terror, a clown on the outside would chatter in reply, Yes, Captain Bly. It became my unpleasant task to visit each of the two hundred-odd buildings and tell the men in charge that no further catcalls would be tolerated. I pride myself on the fact that not once did I wink or show by any outward manifestation what I thought, although at times I must admit that I found it difficult to keep a straight face when some able mimic would sham mock horror at the thought of my suspecting him. I remember one gaunt lad in particular called Polykopf, whose strange name later became famous at the depot. He was a gifted mimic and one of the first to adopt the cry, What's that, Mr. Christian? He feigned ignorance of what I was talking about. Very well, Polykopf, I said, but in the future save your jibes for the enlisted men. It is dangerous to go about mocking naval captains. Aye, aye, sir, he replied in military fashion. I could detect no mimicry in his voice, although there must have been much in his mind. I will follow your advice, sir. Save my efforts for the enlisted men. The result of my extensive tour was that any bitterness the enlisted men felt for Captain Kelly was thereafter hidden. I took no sides in the arguments that were rife among the officers and men alike concerning the captain's ability. As a matter of fact, I now think he was one of the ablest men I knew in the Navy. The incident of the hurricane doors will show what I mean. One day the depot received orders from Noumea to take proper precautions against hurricanes. Our entire island received the order. Other activities made up a routine hurricane bill, whereby personnel would be evacuated to safe land and gear lashed down as well as possible. Such cavalier precautions would not do for Captain Kelly. He appointed a committee to study what should be done in event of sustained and gusty winds up to 150 miles an hour. He established one building as a testing ground and ran small handcars loaded with concrete down inclines to determine at what point Quonset huts buckled. He studied all he could find on hurricanes, and then asked me to converse with planters and natives in the region to discover what they knew of hurricanes. I visited each available plantation and learned from the owners that hurricanes occurred once in nine years. The season lasted from January through March. They started with heavy rains which lasted two days. On the beginning of the second day, winds began to rise, and on the night of the second day they came in short bursts, followed by calm spells in which the rain was intensified. If that stage was reached, a proper hurricane was in progress, and it must blow itself out. From natives I learned much about the big winds. In their horrible beche le mer they told me much that was fanciful and more that was instructive. 
One old man who had lived near the channel for half a century told me, Wind he come, he come, he come. Take him, take him, take him. Trees he go, ocean allay, allay. Bimeby wind he go, Vanacoro. He go banks, he go, he go. Bimeby stop. The old man told me this with much waving of arms and many words I did not understand. It was enough, however, to lead my inquiries in the right direction. I determined that whereas floods and lightning might come when the wind was east and north, trees were usually blown down only in the first stages of the hurricane when wind blew from the southeast. By the time it had worked around to the west, danger was gone. I relayed this information to Captain Kelly. Characteristically, he decided instantly that any quonsets whose ends opened to the southeast must be completely repacked so that gear inside would strengthen the relatively frail tin walls. This was a prodigious job, and when the captain informed his officers that work on the project would start immediately, they showed astonishment. We must take no risks that can be avoided, he insisted. Can we do this before the task force arrives? an officer asked. If not, we must do it while the force is here, said Captain Kelly. We shall stow gear at one end of the building and issue it at the other end. By tomorrow noon, see that all issue desks are placed at the north or northwest ends of the buildings. Two nights later, the depot was in the swing of a full nine-hour day, followed by special four-hour emergency duty night, ending with another nine-hour day till dawn. Each man worked thirteen hours a day, seven days in a row. On the seventh night, they worked an additional six hours and were then given a day to sleep. Lights blazed all night. Men shoved and sweated. Even middle-aged men who normally worked as guards were called to duty. A company of marines was brought in to take over their guard duty. Navy chow ashore is rarely as good as it is afloat, and for enlisted men it is usually much worse. As work increased, quality of chow decreased, and lamentations were loud. Nevertheless, men worked on, with no beer, no movies, poor food, frightened officers, and relentless Captain Kelly in charge, the men worked on, ninety hours a week. Tension at such times mounts. Half the buildings were secured against hurricane when two unfortunate things happened. The rain started and the fleet came in. The rain alone could have been tolerated. The skies opened torrentially every morning, afternoon, evening and night. Like a cow on a flat rock, old navy hands said. In between the sun shone and generated steam wherever water lay. Men's shirts were never dry save for one fleeting instant when the sun had finished evaporating rainwater and sweat had not yet started to pour. Mould grew everywhere and men afflicted with fungus found it spreading rapidly. The rains were started, but to have rain and the fleet at one time was too much. For most ships' crews, the depot was a place to loaf and a place from which the most wonderful things could be procured if, if you knew somebody, you might get a radio, if you could wangle a chit, you might get two new knives, if you pestered a hot, ill-tempered storekeeper long enough, he might give you a wristwatch band in desperation, and if you could manage to finagle a boiled ham or a tinned turkey or a coconut cake, well, you could probably get an entire Quonset hut, and the storekeeper thrown in. All day men of the depot would work and quarrel with men of the fleet. Then at night they would wrestle with boxes to protect their buildings against a hurricane which might never come. And invariably the fleet wanted what had two days before been packed at the bottom of the pile against the doors. It was my job to keep the enlisted men happy, and I think I succeeded. At any rate, the depot never before handled so much gear in so short a time but I could not have succeeded in keeping spirits up had I not received help from a most unusual quarter. A man in a long black coat said he was from naval intelligence. He appeared one night at about two. It was a dark, rainy night, and work had been knocked off. The floodlights were dark, and in the channel rode a hundred ships. Mysteriously, at the east end of the depot, a man in a long black trench coat appeared. Naval intelligence, he whispered to the guard. What's up? the guard whispered in return. Horrible, Longcoat replied. Japanese saboteurs have landed at the other end of the island. Oh my God, the guard whispered. Stand your post. We are getting reinforcements. They are going to try to blow this place up. Stop the strike. We have got to outwit them. I will be in charge. When I flash my light once, you will fire twice, up in the air. That will keep us together. Then the troops can take over. Yes, sir, 
the guard replied grimly. Up and down the buildings the man in the long coat went. Few of the men standing guard had ever expected to be addressed by a man from naval intelligence. They were stunned at the audacity of the Japanese, but they were ready. At about 2.35, the man in the long coat suddenly appeared where three guards could see him, flash. The guards fired twice each into the dark night. Long coat hastened to another vantage point, flash. Four more guards fired. Down the long row of buildings hurried long coat, flashing his light and drawing a fusillade. When he reached the last guards, he flashed his light four times. A true volley of shots responded. Then Longcoat disappeared. By the time the second batch of guards had fired, half the officers were out of bed. By the time the last watchman had followed instructions, many officers aboard ships were awake. Lights flashed in earnest now. Bells jangled. And before long, Captain Kelly himself appeared, quiet, incisive, and determined. It is a hoax, sir! a lieutenant reported. What's that, sir? Kelly asked. A hoax, sir! Somebody fooled the guards! Captain Kelly said nothing. He grew pale with anger, personally interrogated each guard. He did not raise his voice nor display his rage in any way. Relentlessly, he pursued his questioning, and by the time he had reached the last guard, descriptions and hints had mounted so rapidly that we knew for certain who the culprit was. We went directly to his bunk, and there we found him, shoes wet, and a long coat at the foot of his bunk. It was Polykopf. He had followed my instructions to the letter. Captain Kelly did the speaking. Polykopf? he asked. Yes, sir, the boy in the bunk replied. Stand up. Naked, Polykopf obeyed. Put your clothes on. Yes, sir. Did you give the guards orders to fire? Kelly asked. Yes, sir. Captain Kelly turned his back on Polykopf. Arrest that man, he ordered. The master-at-arms led Polykopf away. By that time, sleep was impossible. I and another officer inspected all guards, checked their revolvers, and issued new ammunition. When we reached the office, base police were there. While we talked, the island commander called on the phone. Blinker was going out to all the ships. One replied, in the slow code of a learner, a message which all could read, God help Polykopf. God and Bus Adams did help Polykopf. God helped by having created in man a sense of humour. Nobody could listen to the story of what happened without smiling. If you had enough rank, you laughed. And if you were an admiral, you roared, but only behind doors. Polykopf's adventure, had it occurred in peacetime, would have been disastrous. He would have been jailed, at the least. But in the South Pacific, with a great strike in the offing, with Japanese trying to infiltrate positions, and with nerves on edge, his actions were a hilarious burlesque of naval life. Men laughed more at Polykopf and his long coat than at any movie the area ever had. For myself, I think it was the long coat that saved him. The idea of anybody in a long coat, all wool, when the thermometer was at 90, was so hilarious that one simply had to laugh. And the burlesque of naval intelligence, which is the most secret and circumspect of all military organisations, was too much. Everyone had to roar at the long woollen coat, that is, everybody but Captain Kelly. He was coldly furious, and ordered a court-martial first thing next morning. But when the problem arose as to what Polykopf was to be charged with, Captain Kelly was stumped. He started to speak three times. Each time he stopped. Damn it, he said, sending Polykopf back to his cell. This needs some looking into. He went in to breakfast. Bus Adams was the officer who threw the gall into Captain Kelly's wound. He laughed about Polykopf at breakfast while the captain was thinking... You know, the insolent pilot said, I don't see what we can try the boy for. Don't call him a boy, Captain Kelly snorted. He is a grown man. What are you going to charge him with on the specification? Adams asked. Impersonating an officer, for one thing, Captain Kelly replied. But he did not, sir, Adams contended. He never said he was an officer. He wore an officer's uniform. Excuse me, sir, Adams replied. There were no insignia on that coat. How do you know? Captain Kelly asked. I looked, Adams answered. Captain Kelly put down his coffee. Why did you look, Mr. Adams? Because, Bus replied, I have done a lot of work with Polykopf. I would not be surprised if he requested me for counsel. Captain Kelly was choleric. Although he could hide his feelings when talking with guards and Polykopf, such insolence from Adams was beyond his understanding. He rose and dismissed us. 
Adams followed us out of the mess hall. I will bet I get back to flying pretty damned soon now, he said. This case is foolproof. Polykopf has not done anything. Peace, it is marvellous. Bus was dead right. Polykopf had not done anything. At first, Captain Kelly was going to get him for impersonating naval intelligence, but Polykopf had never said he was naval intelligence. All he did was mutter the words mysteriously. The captain tried to pin a charge of giving an unlawful order, but he knew that would not stick. For Polykopf had not ordered anybody to do anything. He had merely suggested it. He and Adams went round and round in circles, bus never yielding a point. Captain Kelly finally thought of something. In speaking to one of the guards, Polykopf had stepped into a restricted area. The man had broken a lawful order. This was it. They would try Polykopf for trespass. But again God intervened, and Bus Adams. Everywhere Navy men met, Bus would merely drop the hint that, Boy, this time they really got him. Trespass! At that the assembly would break into a roar. In time the laughter reached Captain Kelly. He called Polykopf to his office. Then he dismissed the master-at-arms. Polykopf, he said, we can't hold you, much as I want to. This is a navy of laws. You can thank heaven it is. I intended to punish you drastically for what you did. You endangered the war effort. You impeded our work. Fortunately for you, I would have to cook up some general charge to punish you adequately. The navy does not like that. It is a navy of laws, Polykopf. You have rights that even I cannot trespass. Inadvertently, he winced at the word. You may go, Polykopf. Your time in jail is your punishment. Captain Kelly wheeled around and looked out the window. Then he whipped his chair around once more. Man to man, Polykopf, and what either of us says must never leave this room? Agreed? Yes, sir. Did Lieutenant Adams put you up to this? Oh, no, excuse me, sir. No, sir. The sailor was so obviously astonished by the question that he must be telling the truth. Captain Kelly dismissed him. From then on, Bus Adams had rough sailing. A great carrier came into the channel for supplies. Bus was forbidden to go aboard. He was not permitted to fly with pilots he had known in the States. They zoomed the volcanoes on Vanikoro and flew low over jungle villages. He had to stay behind on desk work that mysteriously piled up. He worked and swore and worked. Like the rest of us, he did more work in a week than he had ever before done in a month. He began to reconsider some of the snide jokes he had once pulled on the supply corps. Real officers with their brains beat out, he used to say. Now he began to wonder if maybe the seashore navy was not the real navy, and the big boat boys were merely a gang of vacationists. Even the weather conspired against bus. He finally arranged to borrow a plane from the carrier on his day off. To hell with sleep. He could sleep any time, but he could not fly into Vanikoro volcanoes again. But on the day he was to fly, definite word was received that a hurricane was moving north. All ships for the strike moved out into the ocean under, forced draft and headed away from the great storm. We had to stay and take it. We stayed at the depot and watched other activities move on to higher ground. We tied down our sleeping quarters while other units abandoned theirs and fled to safe positions. We locked doors, moved trucks against weak walls, hustled delicate instruments and chronometers to a small hill, broke out helmets to wear in case trees should blow over, and waited. The fleet was gone by the time night fell on the second day of rain. There was a strong wind from one point off south. Gradually it veered to south-southeast. There it stayed and increased in velocity. It was now forty miles an hour, but it was still constant. I had the watch that night, and for a while I hoped that the wind was subsiding. It did, for half an hour. Then a huge gust came in eight or ten violent puffs. I judged the velocity of the puffs to be about ninety miles an hour. Then there was another calm. I saw the rain perpendicular against the tired lights. Slowly, slowly it began to slant toward the coconut palms, in from the empty channel. Then, with a burst of tremendous power, the slanting rain was cracked like a whip and lay out parallel to the ground. A light went out, and then another. Wires were whipped away like the rain. Coconut trees threw their palms toward the hills, as if eager to flee, and some went down. Building 97 is buckling, a voice cried over the phone. Our plan was to rush fire trucks and dump wagons to any building that weakened, but before I could put the plan into operation I could hear above the storm the sound of a Quonset hut ripping to pieces. 
Building 185 is going. All men safe, another voice reported, and then that phone went dead. Runners came into the barricaded office, breathless and afraid. It is rough out there, one advised. We cannot send trucks into it. We will have to trust to luck. We did. All that night, men kept running to and from watch to tell me of incidents that occurred. At twenty-three, Captain Kelly left his post at the switchboard and came in with me. Two other officers reported from a foot tour of the buildings. They are holding, Captain, the inspection party reported. In furious gusts, the wind howled and drove water through every opening in every building and shack. One generator burned out and half the depot was in darkness. Cooks brought kettles of coffee at three. Potato shack done for, they reported. A jeep must have been left in neutral against strict orders. The wind caught it and dashed it through the night until it struck a building. Then quiet followed, and from all parts of the depot men rushed in with reports. Dripping from rain and sweat, they blurted out their news and left. Mostly they cried, They are still standing! 